we're in a 10-part series. This is part seven, but it's the last one where we're going to be talking about issues around hell and the questions concerning those. We've already gone through so many scriptures, and today we're going to go through the scriptures that deal with fire and a couple of other ones, and I think that you're going to be encouraged by today. But we're going to start with a passage that was just read to you by Holly that seems very, very negative uh, and seems to have zero hope. That part in Hebrews chapter 6, we won't read it all, but verses 4 through 6 where it says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. It's impossible. Well, doesn't that mean that you're gone and you're gone forever? No. No, it doesn't. It says it's impossible for them to fix this. But in Matthew chapter 19, verses 25 and 26, Jesus reminds his apostles in no uncertain terms, whenever they talk about something being impossible, he says it is impossible for men, but nothing is impossible for God. That changes everything. And we tend to use one verse, put our definitions to it, and expand it to mean everything in every place. And we think we're being true to Scripture, but we're not when we do that. Well, what about in Revelation? Because a Revelation can be rather troubling. In fact, the, the history of the book of Revelation is fraught. Uh, there were, it, it was the last book to be admitted into the canon of Scripture. There were a lot of disputes about it because of how symbolic it really is. And remember, you're entering a book full of hyperbole, symbols, metaphors, and imagery. And it can seem very bizarre to us, less so if you really know your Old Testament, and not just the, the favorite bits, but the way the language works in the Old Testament, but still a confusing place. So in Revelation 21 and verse 8, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Remember that, the lake of burning sulfur. Back up one chapter in chapter 20 and verse 10. And the devil and, and who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, we've already gone over this. And you already know that forever and ever literally just means for times and times or for ages and ages. And quite a few of the newer versions are correctly translating it that way because they didn't have the concept of eternity. You will not find eternity in Scripture except for a couple of times as a noun. And even then, if we translated it correctly, it'd be till the end of the age. That said, notice I, I, I told you, notice the sulfur. What's going on in sulfur? Sulfur in the first centuries was not used to destroy things. It was a fire used to purify things, not to take them off the planet. It was also used as a medicine, as a fumigant. They believed that if you burn sulfur, it would clear the impurities out of the air. As somebody who doesn't care for the smell of sulfur, I quibble with that somewhat. I can remember coming back from Scotland and visiting my wife's relatives in Texas and being given a glass of uh, sweet tea, because that's what they do, with ice in it and learning quickly that I needed to drink it fast before the ice melted because their water tasted of sulfur. And the, the longer the cubes melted, the more sulfur you had in there. And you can actually, I've driven through the town of Sulfur, Louisiana. Yep. Uh, but it was used as a fumigant. It was also used as a bleaching agent. Uh, still is in some places as a way to cleanse impurity. In other words, sulfur burning was used to cleanse something to make it usable or healthy not to destroy it. And by the way, that ages and forever and ever, uh, 
it is not scientific, it's anecdotal, and the plural of anecdote is not data. I get that. But there have been tens of thousands of people reporting near-death experiences. And one of the things that over 80% of them report is that there's no such thing as time, that it might be a second or it might be a thousand years. They feel completely dissociated from time. Well, the Bible says whenever our time comes and the time that the earth is renewed or whatever happens at the end, the call is time shall be no more. Time's gone. And what seems like forever can be a moment and vice versa. Remember, God said that about himself through Peter. A day is to the Lord as a thousand years. A thousand years is as of a day. So ages and ages, yes. And the word torment there, that they would be tormented, had a legal common usage. And that was for judicial torture. I won't go down this rabbit hole right now, but just be aware that it was a land of no rights. There were no Bill of Rights. There was nothing like a constitution. Therefore, if you were pulled off the street, you would be tortured. That was, it didn't really matter if you were innocent or guilty or what evidence they had. They tortured you. It was just part of the process. Judicial torture is the word used here for torment. A judicial torture. You didn't kill him. The torture didn't last forever. As, as abhorrent as torture always is. It didn't last forever in our terms of the use of the word forever. In fact, it was also used for secondary purpose. And a tormentor was somebody who checked the value of silver or gold coins to see if there was impurity in them. If you remember, Archimedes is the one who figured out that displacement of water with weight would help you see how pure gold was. And that's when he was supposed to have yelled Eureka when he found that out. Well, they found a way to cleanse it was burning. And yeah, they used sulfur agents as they did that. It reminds us of Paul, as we've read before, saying that others who have not built on Christ or their foundation is shaky or what they built was wrong will be saved as through fire, but saved. The lake of God's fire is a refining fire. And Revelation earlier says in chapter 2 and verse 17 that those who come through this period of difficulty will be given a new name a new stone with their name written on it. Now, when we talk about the fact that God intends to save all people, always leaving room for annihilation if someone chooses that, I understand. I think the scripture leaves room for it, so we have to do that as well. But generally speaking, universal salvation, some questions come up. And I want to deal with those pretty quickly here, fairly quickly, I guess is a more proper way to say that. Some will say, well, why would we evangelize or do mission work at all? If everybody's eventually or ultimately saved, several reasons. One, God doesn't want us to die in our sins. God doesn't want us to face punishment. Temporary though it may be, it is still punishment and it is still a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I would rather that the people I meet in the shops, the people that I meet as I go about speaking, the people in this room and the people watching, the thousands that will uh, come through the week listening to this and sharing it, I would rather you be greeted with a warm hug than punishment. Therefore, yes, we're going to talk about this. Yes, we want people to be saved now. And besides... Salvation is not fire insurance. And it seems that that's what we've made it. I used to go to church for fire insurance. You had to do the five acts of worship. In our church, we had five acts of worship, not counting announcements, which would have been the sixth, had we been really picky, because those were always there too. But we had these acts of worship to the point where, and one of them was singing. Well, I've always had a weak voice, and there were times that my voice was very, very croaky. And even, as a boy, though, I would try to croak out at least one verse so that I wouldn't go to hell. I had, I had to check the boxes. You had to have everything done right. And it was all fire insurance. Salvation is not about fire insurance. It's about living the life of Jesus in the here and now. Being an outpost of heaven in the here and now. 
rather like our friends who are going into uh, eastern Tennessee and western North Carolina. Uh, thank you for those of you that have been giving. You have done exceptionally well, and the money's still coming in, so we're still taking it to one generation away. Uh, they generally are referred to as one gen or one gen away around here. They are very involved. They are a very lean machine. What you give gets to the people. And we're very well aware of the roadblocks and such that bureaucracy is placed around there, but we also know how to get in there. So I'm just going to put it that way. And those of you in harm's way in Florida, we pray that it doesn't happen. If it does, we're not going to abandon you either. That's what we do. Live the life here and now. Be an outpost of heaven here and now. And by the way, I'm just going to say to my team, I was supposed to make an announcement at the first of this. I didn't do that. So I'll make it later when I answer the questions, maybe. So, <clears throat> and, and also please remember to pray for people around the world because tomorrow is October 7th, the anniversary of a horrific slaughter and beastly behavior that some are celebrating. And we need to pray for the victims and the hostages that are still hostages in the tunnels today. Why do we say be saved now? Well, there is value to the kingdom of heaven on earth. We're commanded to love our God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And I would say that is sorely needed on this planet. More loving of God and loving of our neighbors. Any, ask any victim of war, any victim of injustice, if they would like to see more kingdom of heaven here, or if it's okay just to wait. They want it here. They want it now. It would have, they could have avoided all the pain that they suffered had it been here now. It's our job to manifest that here now. The greatest growth of Christianity occurred when most Christians believed that all people would eventually be saved. The first 300 years of the church, it grew like wildfire because the people were excited, optimistic, and full of love with the good news that you're going to be saved. And here's the God that's going to save you. Live for him now. When they all understood that Jesus came to give life, give it more abundantly, their lives are transformed, and they welcomed others to share in that blessing. And this... On this earth, now, you can have forgiveness of sins. On this earth, now, you can have reconciliation with God and with others. On this earth, you can overcome harmful habits, destructive lifestyles, bad choices. On this earth, now, you can overcome. That is good news. Why would we not share that now? Instead of saying, well, eventually, it'll work out for you but we're just going to let you suffer? When we love our neighbors, the Bible specifically mentions that our neighbors include our enemies, that we are to love them, to do good for them, to pray for them, to not return evil for evil, but to return good when evil is done. What kind of world would it be if we brought it now? On the other hand, Let's just be very honest. Constantly warning people of hell doesn't sound like good news. It didn't to me, and I really believe it didn't to you either. Unless you're one of those twisted individuals, and I choose the adjective on purpose, who um, really enjoys the idea that your enemies are going to burn. And there's something wrong with your heart if you feel that. I don't want anybody to burn forever. While there will be punishment, yes, I get that. I don't want anybody to suffer forever. Francis, Saint Francis Xavier, now, perhaps the first, perhaps the first Christian missionary to, to Japan, wrote this in 1522. Uh, Xavier was absolutely a firm believer in absolute torment, torture pit that would last forever. And he wondered why his mission wasn't going well. So he wrote this, quote, one of the things that most of all pains and torments these Japanese 
is that we teach them that the prison of hell is irrecoverably shut. So there is no egress therefrom. For they grieve over the fate of their departed children, of their parents and relatives, and they often show their grief by their tears. <coughs> so they ask us, is there any hope, any way to free them by prayer from that eternal misery? And I'm obliged to answer that there is absolutely none. Is it any wonder that after all these years, 502 years now, 702 years now, Japan is still only about 3% Christian. It is, in fact, the least God-fearing nation on earth. While it is an exceptionally polite uh, nation, an exceptionally peaceful nation, and there is so much to uh, admire about the nation, if asked about God and belief that there really is a God, they have the lowest numbers. One wonders. George Saris wrote this. Uh, he said in his experience, the doctrine of eternal damnation has caused far more people to be driven away from the faith than drawn to it. And then Saris quotes a friend and a fellow missionary who once taught the traditional doctrine of hell and now believes in universal reconciliation. She said this, quote, I used to be afraid to share the gospel for fear that the conversation would come around to the subject of hell. I was afraid that someone would ask, what about those who've never heard? Or how can a good God allow billions of people to be tormented forever? Or what's the point to bringing people into existence only to suffer in this life, die, and then suffer forever? with no hope of relief, end of quote. And by the way, if you've not wondered about the third, I wonder about you. But I'm aware that Calvinists teach that before we were born, God decided whether we go to hell or not. I'm sorry, I cannot buy into that. There's nothing in scripture that teaches me that. But she goes on to say this, quote, now I am free to share the gospel without worrying and without being trapped by good questions that have no answers. I can confidently proclaim that God is love. At the same time, I can confidently proclaim that he is holy and righteous. He is a consuming fire, and he will not let anyone get away with anything. He will do, listen carefully, he will do what it takes to make sinners holy, fit for spending eternity in his presence. So let's talk about fire. As always, the sermon notes are provided for you in the description box on YouTube. It is always free. It's in English. It's also in Spanish. They are there, and we don't ever take them down. They're all there. So you can have the notes, you can use them, and it is not copyrighted. The only copyrighted thing we do on any of our nearly 1,000 videos now are the songs, and those copyrights belong to somebody else, and we pay for the right to do those. Everything else, you may chop up the video and you can, I've even had, I've had lots of ministers say, can we have your notes? We're going to be preaching on that. And I've heard my sermon before as I'm, and I'm, that's cool because I stole everything from this book. You can steal from me. All right. No attribution needed at all. Um, we're all plagiarizing somebody. If you forget where it came from. Consider it original. How's that? <laughs> well, let's talk about the fire. God is a fire in the Bible many times. He is love, but he can be a fire or manifest as a fire. For the first, God is a consuming or a devouring fire. When we put that up, we have to ask what is being consumed or devoured. And people assume it means the spirits when he talks about the sins. And... Daniel chapter 7, fire flows from his presence. Why would fire flow from the presence of a God that says he is love? Because love must be connected to something the fire is doing. God appears as a fire in a burning bush. In Exodus 3, I would like to also ask you, was there a bush? Was it on fire? And people will say, yes and yes. My next question is this, did it burn up? The Bible specifically says it didn't burn up. When God appears as a fire, it's not a destructive force. The pillar of fire appears as God's presence. 
at night, a cloud during the day. Why would a pillar of fire bring comfort, guidance, and a sense of identity if fire was there to be destructive punishment and torment? You see, they looked upon fire in a different way. In fact, in Isaiah and Revelation, God's tongue, breath, eyes, and mouth are like flames of fire. And that's considered a good thing because it takes away the impurities. It takes away the sins, but it doesn't destroy the people that it is cleansing. That's why Isaiah will say the fires will come and then our children will rejoice in the land again. It's because they are cleansed. God's glory and um, I'm sorry, flames of fire. This is kind of a, it's a weird image for me. The flames of fire coming from the nostrils of God but it's a popular one. It's in Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Breathing fire. Then God's glory, Zechariah 2.5, is a flame of fire. Why is it his glory? Because it purifies. It itself is pure, and it purifies that with which it comes into contact. And then Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 1, and this is where it's found twice there. Uh, he, is, he appears as flashes of fire that burn with splendor. Both Daniel and John the Revelator envision God as sitting on a throne of fire with a face like lightning and eyes like flaming torches. Do we take any of that literally? No. But then why another chapter later when it talks about thrown into a fire, do people assume that's a, that's a real eternal torture bed? Instead of going back to the throne of fire, the lake of fire may just mean a confrontation with the God who sits on the throne of fire. His people are not consumed by fire, just like the bush were not, was not consumed. And who are his people? That's the next question. People say, oh, just his people? Who are his people? Well, let me ask you a question in return. Who is your neighbor? Do you remember that when Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself, the people said, well, who is our neighbor? Because they were surrounded by enemies, the Romans, the Gentiles of many stripes. And they said, so who's our neighbor? And he picks a Samaritan to tell the story. To them, the Samaritan was the worst of the worst of the worst. And he has the Samaritan be the hero of the story, taking care of one of them. And he said, now, and he even has clergy people walking by, doing nothing. And he says, So tell me, who was the neighbor to the man who was robbed? And they don't even say, well, it's obvious, a Samaritan. They say, I guess it was the Samaritan (laughs) people. You know, it's just, these aren't trick questions. We can see the obvious. Therefore, we love our enemies because our enemies are our neighbors. And who are God's people? Who's your neighbor? Anybody made in the image of God is God's person. Malachi sees God, and I I love the image. It's in um, Malachi chapter 2, verses, I'm sorry, 3, verses 2 and 3, and also in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, as a cleansing fire, a purifying, sometimes it's translated a refining fire, like a coin. Note something. Sins and all of these are being destroyed, but there's no mention of the spirits being destroyed. Not bushes, not people. And these are symbols given to us in symbolic language, so we don't take them literally. We understand that the streets of of heaven are not paved with literal gold bricks. That wouldn't be lasting very long. Gold is very malleable. It wears away very quickly. If you've had a wedding ring made of solid gold you know that it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And you've got to have that repaired and such. um, Keeps the jewelers in business, I'm sure. We understand poetic and symbolic language, and we should use that same brain to understand symbolic language when it speaks of fire. Even as it speaks of a refining or purifying fire, but not an eternal torturous one. Now stay with me. God is love. He never states that he is something other 
than love. He loves justice, and he is a just God. But his nature is defined by himself as love. He is also seen by, right, by sinful men and by righteous men as a fire. Somehow the fire has to be an act of love. God is not schizophrenic. He is not bipolar. He is not evil. He does, does not delight in evil. In fact, he even defines love in 1 Corinthians 13 in many ways, but one of it is it takes no delight in evil. It's always seeking the good of the other. He is love. So how would this work? Well, here's the thing. I want to emphasize here that God does not let us in on all of his ways and plans. Wish he did. In Revelation, John the Revelator sees something and it's about the future and what's going to happen. We always want, you know, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? About the ultimate end of all humans and the angel reaches over and says, don't write this. This isn't for them. Now that bothers me a bit because I'd like to know. I'd like to have that kind of information. But then again, our brains are our tissue. We don't, the mind and the brain are different places and different things. And it is still, we have not located the mind. That's all I'm going to tell you. Neuroscience is its own thing. And uh, I still play in it a lot. And it's a real argument where the mind is sourced. It isn't the brain. The brain's involved. But it, there's something different. We've seen people who have shut down, flatlined on the EEG, and yet come back and can talk about things that happened in their room and out of their room. The mind is still alive. We have tens of thousands of these testimonies, and we wouldn't pay attention to them except that they line up, even from people in other cultures, other places and times. Paul said that he saw, when he went through his own near-death experience, remember he was stoned and left for dead, and yet he wasn't. He revived and came up. He said he saw something when he was caught up that it's not lawful to speak of. We can only work with what we've been given. The next couple of weeks, we're going to talk a lot more about the heaven side of this. That'll be, that'll be fun. A lot more fun for me than this. Why do we spend so much time talking about hell? Because churches have spent too much time talking about hell. So we have to unwrap the onion. By the way, if you only dip into one or two of these sermons, you're not really going to get the whole blast. I don't get more money or anything if you listen to all of them. That's not the thing. I'm just saying we had to unpeel an onion. And so you really need to kind of, if you want to listen, if you're old enough to remember a record, if you want to listen to a record, the best way to do it is to start at the beginning, not to flick the needle and just let it skip along, grabbing a verse here or two. So, you know, unpack it. But whenever God does tell us about things, we see fire refining and the fire bringing people closer to a God who's on the throne of fire. Whenever I'm talking about universal salvation or reconciliation and then fire is involved with cleansing of sins, I want to stress again, I think third week in a row, it is not going to be your experience if you follow Christ now. I'm not talking about follow Christ perfectly. If you could follow Christ perfectly, you wouldn't have needed him. But you follow him. You, you become an outpost of heaven. You become a disciple of Christ now, living out the kingdom of God now. When you die, your sins are not held against you. Please remember in Matthew 25, the people were saved, didn't believe they deserved it. And he said, yes, you did. Come on in. We're talking about those who have not come to Christ that see the fire. But don't let that panic us. A person who dies and is not a Christian, perhaps they've never seen a Christian or a Bible or heard the name of Christ. One look at the throne is all they're going to need. One blast of the love of God is all they're going to need to hit their knees and worship him. Another person dies, 
who's not a Christian. They take their sins. Perhaps they were a murderer. Perhaps they violated people. They will experience a refining fire. Is it painful to confront God and their sins? Yes. I've reviewed, and again, neuroscience is kind of my thing. Uh, I didn't go to school for doing this. Can you tell? Um, the, I guess I went through a harder school, but it didn't give degrees. How's that? I've, I've reviewed literally tens of thousands of those that say, you know, the records say they died, and then they didn't die. They undied. You know, and, and most of them don't come back with stories. Most of them don't. About 20% do. And the stories line up. One that really got me was of a man named, I'm just going to call him Tim. And Tim, when he died, was confronted with things he did that he had even forgotten and it brought it back to him. And one of them was a fight he got into. A man came up to his truck. The man was obvious to him, drunk, disoriented. And Tim just started beating him, left out of the truck, beating. Because that's the kind of guy Tim was. And he said, I experienced the fight as if I was him. I felt his terror. I felt my fist on him. I saw my face in rage, and it scared me. I went through all, and this, this happened like this, and then he was brought back. Yeah, imagine it happening that way, that you have to see everything from the viewpoint of the people you hurt, and then from the viewpoint of God. You have to feel every hurt you've caused any person. You experience all the pain you caused. Now, that, how long will that take? As long as it takes is we don't have time after this. Time ceases. There's no way to describe it. But you will feel the love of God drawing you, just like our brother on death row that I'm going to go see, Lord willing, this weekend. He will confess many, many, many crimes. But when God found him on death row, I have talked to him about this so many times because I'm saying, Bobby, I want to make sure I'm getting this because Mr. Science here, I'm having trouble working off your feelings. But I know before this date, you were a bad man. After this date, nobody can find anything bad to say about you for decades and he'll talk about that hitting him. He felt nothing in that encounter but love. And love broke him and changed him. That was enough. Do we not believe God can do that anytime here? Why do we think that at the end, at our death, God's power is gone, his desire is gone, his love is gone? He never said that. He never said that. And remember that Jesus said that some unfaithful servants, he didn't say those people who were doing the best they could. In fact, the book of Romans kind of argues about those who live by the law without having the law are better than those who have the law and don't live by it. Makes you wonder. But Jesus said unfaithful servants, those who weren't very unfaithful or had good intentions will receive few blows, but those that are evil will receive many blows. But he never said they would always receive blows. There's a limited amount. Even the unfaithful, the bad guys, there's a limited amount. Because our God loves us, he is a fire that will cleanse and redeem the world. Because God doesn't just love the world. The Bible says God so loved the world. I mean, there's a difference. If somebody says, I love you, and then somebody looks and leans in and goes, I so love you. That's different. And then when somebody who says, I so love you, puts themselves, God put himself on the line for us before we even acknowledged him. That's why he breaks into history and says, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. I so love you. 
That's who we follow. That's who we love.